Welcome to this week's program of Ascend, Life on the Autism Spectrum. I'm Keith Halperin. And I'm Will Burnick. Okay. And today's guest is Eric Asher, Communications Associate of Respectability, about which we will hear a great deal. So, Will, before we begin, what's with your shirt this week? Oh, my for my first shirt of 2021, I'm wearing my University of Tennessee, uh, my University of Tennessee shirt. Um, it was sent to me by my uncle Jim and Aunt Pam, from, and it, it it's represents the University of Tennessee. It came it came from the Great Orange of Knoxville. Excellent, excellent. Well, now we'll get into uh, interviewing with our guest. Uh, Will, would you like to begin with our uh, guest, Eric Asher of Respectability? Gladly. First question, tell us about respectability. What are your goals and activities? So first of all, um, it's great to be here with all of you. Um, so my name is Eric Asher. I am the Communications Associate at Respectability. And our mission is to fight stigmas and advance opportunities so that people with disabilities can fully participate in all aspects of community. Um, there are three prongs to our work. Um, we fight stigmas, we advance opportunities, and we work on authentic leadership. Um, so advancing opportunities is our policy work. Um, I'm not a policy wonk, so I can't speak too much about it. Um, our leadership, authentic leadership portion is basically what got me into the respectability. Um, I started out as, as one of our fellows in January of 2018. Um, we now have a remote fellowship with the hope of going back to having some fellows in person after the COVID crisis passes. Um, and what I want to focus on mostly today is our work fighting stigmas. Um, it's our work, in, we basically work with journalists, with media, Hollywood, and we try to promote positive, authentic portrayals of people with disabilities. So. Tell us about your background and how you came to respectability. So as I said, basically, I started as a fellow, um, which, is, which is our um, National Leadership Program um, in January 2018. Um, and I, I'm, on the, I'm on the autism spectrum as well. And so that's my disability connection. Um, and so I really was drawn to respectability because of our work in Hollywood. I find basically as someone who's also openly gay, um, I feel like the LGBT rights movement um, proved that when people see people on screen, they're more likely to be accepting of them in real life. And I feel like the disability community needs the same thing to happen. Tell us about some of the projects you're now working on. Um, I can't talk about some of, I could talk about some things. I can say that one thing I'm very excited about is that we have our um, lab program coming up this summer again. Um, so. I sent a video that we may or may not show that showed some of our 2019 lab program participants. Um, the 2019 and 2020 respectability summer labs have already placed more than 20 alumni in the jobs at the studios that hosted the group, um, including Disney and Paramount. Um, I am very, very excited that the 2021 lab applications will open at some point later this month. And I can't wait to see who applies. Um, and so there's lots of, I can say that another thing that recently happened was um, there was a new report from GLAD that came out um, this week actually, that they every every year they analyze where, how much representation there is on TV of people with disabilities, LGBTQ people, all sorts of other minority groups. And the new report shows a slight uptick in the percentage of series regular characters to 3.5% from 3.1% which is still not nearly good enough, but at least it's going in the right direction. Here's a popular, here's a popular question. Have you been involved with other disabilities besides autism? So uh, I can answer that in two ways. One, I personally only, I'm, I'm on the autism spectrum, that's me, just I'm only on the autism spectrum. But respectability works across all different types of disabilities. We're really one organization that covers all different disabilities. Um, and a lot of the examples I'm gonna bring up um, that I'd like to, some of the best shows that we've worked on are not autism specific, but 
we cover all, a whole range of disabilities, so. Eric, now we'll hear from uh, Jennifer Brooks, our book correspondent, uh, who has a question or two for you. Yes, Eric, so I heard you mention the slight uptick in the quantity of representation. I was wondering if you could comment briefly on the accuracy of those representations. Um, first of all, I will actually say that um, the number of characters did actually not go up. It was just a percentage because there were less characters this year. Um, but I will also, so the, there was an uptick in percentage, but not an actual quantity. The number of characters was the same from 2019 to 2020. Um, and the, I will say it's very mixed, the accuracy. There are some great examples. There are obviously some less great examples. Um, um, and I think things are going in the right direction, but obviously there's a lot more work to do. Yeah. So which do you think is the best example, the one that people should be watching? Um, I could go over lots of different examples that are really good, but my personal favorite from this past year um, is um, Special um, on Netflix, which features Ryan O'Connell playing a fictionalized version of himself. Um, he's openly gay and he has cerebral palsy. Um, and he was actually the only LGBTQ character with a disability on a streaming service. And I watched the show, it's a little unsafe for work, but it is, it's a fantastic comedy and Ryan's great and we need more shows like this on TV. Thank you, Eric. Um, and thank you, Jennifer. So I understand that uh, you may not be able to describe uh, some of the current projects that you've been involved with, but could you give our viewers a sort of an overview of how respectability goes in to a particular uh, studio production company and what you actually do? Can you take us through what actually happens and give an example of uh, one that respectability is particularly proud of? Um, I'm more than happy to. Um, so basically, we've consulted on specific projects we do for with A and E, NBC, Netflix, Disney, Pixar, and others. Um, and we are um, we do all sorts of things based on what people ask for us. Um, we do script reviews. We um, work with um, writers and producers and trying to get characters authentically cast ideally um, and we work um, to make sure that when pe people display the repertoire on the screen it's accurate and positive. Um, so uh, probably our, the thing we were most, our first major success was Born This Way which was a docuseries on A&E about people with Down syndrome who work, fall in love, live successful lives, and the show was a huge success, um, brought lots of new people to a and &E, not new viewers, um, lasted for three seasons and won some Emmys, which is very good for the network and very good for the show as in the cast. And it's, we were intimately involved with, we consulted very heavily on that show. And um, one of our events was actually featured in an episode of that show, which was pretty cool. Um, and all I'll say is that there's more great stuff coming. So. Excellent. Are there particular projects in the past that specifically have dealt with um, members of the autistic community that you'd care to uh, discuss with us or you were able to discuss with us? Um, I'm trying to think. I know for a fact that we have had some. I can't think of any off the top of my head. But, okay, understood. Um, I know there have been some. How does uh, respectability find out about a particular uh, upcoming project? Or do you have uh, your liaisons with the various studios and production companies and saying, uh, keep track of what they're doing and please let us know and then we'll proceed accordingly. So how do you actually originally get involved as far as respectability is concerned? So um, the, the great thing, my, my supervisor, Lauren, who is our communications, I'm vice president of communications, um, she basically likes us to tell the story. I'm going to paraphrase. I'm not going to tell her as good as Lauren would tell it, but I'll try my best. Um, she used to have to go knock on the doors of the studios and try to get them to, to care about this stuff. But right about two years ago, mm -hmm. things started to shift, and now people are knocking on her door. Um, wow. And it's it's a lot better now. Um, things are definitely, if 
we feel like the studios are starting to care a bit more about this issue and it's 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 things are going in the right direction basically which is i'm, I'm very so, excited about some of the stuff that isn't released yet so if i hear you correctly uh things have changed very substantially from the time when lauren had to either literally or figuratively dock knock on the doors to now when the studios and production companies are are coming to her and to the to respectability and so that would be something like oh we are doing a um a project or planning a project which deals with the um disability community or various other groups that uh respectability is working with can you work with us to make sure we're doing things properly and in a respectful and inclusive manner is that correct that is correct um and one other thing i will add is that lauren and lauren and our team basically we we realize that we don't we're only going to Whenever we get a request about a specific disability, Lauren will try her best to find someone with that disability to help her out um, with the project because we want to get things right. And unless we actually include the people with the actual disability, we're, we're not going to do that. So we work really hard to have like a team of people that work with us on these consulting projects, which is really helpful. We'll now hear a couple of questions from uh, Stacy Kennedy, our cultural correspondent. And then I understand we'll be following up with a brief video from respectability. And Stacy, take it from there. Sure, hi. Um, I was wondering uh, how do um, people with disabilities uh, get representation in, in this field? Um, so, our goal is basically that in a couple of years, our hope, our hope is that we won't be needed anymore. We don't want consultants, we don't want studios to rely on consultants for um, disability inclusion. We want people to be hired to work behind the camera and in front of the camera so that they don't have to, they don't have to check with someone else. We want them to be able to check with themselves. And they could just be hired, no questions asked. I mean, you know, they're there, they, they deserve it, so. Yes, we, we want people who, who who should be who are talented and ready to work to be able to work regardless of whether or not they have a disability. Um, so one of one of the ways we're trying to facilitate this growth is actually our lab program. Um, and so the first year we did this was 2019, and we had lots of studio. We had a, a group of like 30 people with disabilities, whoever beginning of their careers or middle of their careers. And we were take, we basically did like a, a, a several week program in Los Angeles where we had, had them go to different studios for sessions and trainings and learn from the studios and networking events. And we got a lot of people placed at jobs, um, which was awesome. And then we did it again last year. It was originally supposed to be in person again last year, but you know, COVID kind of screwed that up for everybody. So we had an, we had an online lab last year, which was in a way kind of sucked because we missed out on some of some of the in-person opportunities. But the good thing about that is that we were able to let anyone from the country get into it. Um, and so we had um, we had a lot more people in the lab last year, which was fun. And so this year we're doing it again. Um, Applications will open at some point this month, which I'm very excited about. And I get to read some of these applications and it's really fun to see who applies and how much talent there is in the disability community, so. Great to hear, thanks. And so the video I'd like to show um, is a video showing some of our 2019 lab participants talking about their time in the program. And, Eric, I understand that respectability is interested in getting people of our communities uh, jobs both in front of the camera and behind the camera. Could you uh, let us know a little bit about that and then uh, we'll show your video. Okay, so um, the lab program is really not for actors. It's for writers, producers, production assistants, all sorts of people who work behind the camera. There are plenty of other programs for actors um, with disabilities. So but what are pretty great, but our focus is on getting, our focus for a lab at least is getting people behind the camera in writer's rooms, on, in productions, so that they can, our goal is basically, as I said, to make ourselves not needed anymore. We don't want studios to rely on consultants to, to, be, to be more inclusive. We want them to be inclusive because they have people with disabilities working with them. Okay, so um, this video is 
was edited and created by some of our lab participants from 2019, and it features several of them speaking about their time in the lab. The Respectability Summer Lab was amazing. There were so many things that came out of the Respectability Summer Lab that were totally transformative, not just spiritually, but also in terms of our careers. I made some great friendships. I met another storyboard artist there. Uh, she's deaf, and I realized that I really want to hire her for when I make my own show. Respectability for the Summer Labs. I really love the Summer Labs so much. I meet a lot of friends there. I got to meet so many new people, to be around people that were like me. I got to meet so many other creators that were doing work that was pushing the bar and putting people that look like me and that people that I know up front and forward. My passion for advocating for my community has been set on fire. Like I now do presentations with different entertainment organizations and I have the confidence to go and speak out for my community and be that voice that we didn't have before. I've been an advocate for people with disabilities in the industry for over 25, almost 30 years. Last year's Respectability Summer Lab was a real interesting experience for me because I got to be there as a mentor and as an attendee. It was nice to be able to pass on a little information and some of the things that I've learned through the years. Another beautiful thing that happened was we were able to enter spaces that were not necessarily the most accessible historically. As the word goes, gatekeepers, and getting a chance to tell them about people with disabilities, that they are trained and they are available and they're ready to work in film and television. Being able to like go into the room and meet programmers and meet people that are creating fellowships was exceptional in the sense that it helped us sort of demystify the process. I got a whole bunch of opportunities. I got to work briefly for Disney. It's incredibly vital for a lab like Respectability to exist because without that lab, I would not have had the opportunity to walk through that door and meet those future collaborators and investors and gatekeepers. I learned all these different ways that I could help make things more accessible to my friends so that everyone can be more creative and help make Hollywood just better. The Respectability Summer Lab showed me a path that I didn't see before. It made me want to move here. It made me want to start collaborating on projects with people I actually met at the lab. At the lab, I got to meet Nasreen Al-Khatib, and some of our projects have been moving forward in amazing spaces like the Sundance Episodic Lab. We're currently finalists. I had students who would want to work in the entertainment industry, but never applied because they didn't think it was possible. And I think this summer lab program is making it possible. I'm so thankful that this exists, and I'm so excited to see who else comes through the door. Will, I understand you now have a, another question or two for Eric. How how can how can other people how can other people get get in touch with you? How how can other people get in touch with respectability? Okay, um, so we're all over the place. Um, this is my my main responsibility is actually managing our website and our social media. So I love any opportunity I get to plug it. Um, so find us on the web at respectability.org. Um, our Twitter is respect underscore ability. Um, our Facebook is respectability USA. And our Instagram is respect the ability. Um, and we're also on YouTube where you can find all of our webinars and other things like that. And yeah, just keep an eye out. Um, lab applications, as I sort of hinted at, will be opening later this month. There'll be an announcement on our social media about that. And it's been great to talk to you, all of you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Eric Asher of Respectability. I know we'll be hearing lots more about you and Respectability uh, in the, the months and years to come. Thank you. We'll now hear from Jennifer Brooks, our book correspondent. Hey, thank you, Keith. Since we are discussing representations of autistic characters on today's show, today's book is The Speed of Dark a novel by Elizabeth Moon. This book is set in the near future. It's about an autistic character named Lou Arendale, 
He was born in the year 2000. And it doesn't say specifically how old he is, but he's somewhere between 35 and 40, which means the book is set somewhere between 2035 and 2040, which is somewhere between doing the math, that would be 14 and 19 years from now, since this is 2021. And this character has been able to, to make a full life for himself. He holds down a steady job, which is something only currently that only 15% of adults on the autism spectrum are able to achieve. So that's a remarkable achievement in and of itself. And he's also part of a fencing club, you know, one of those extracurricular activities that high school counselors are always telling people to get involved in. So aside from the fact that he doesn't have a girlfriend, you'd say that he's, he's very well adjusted and he leads a full life. So why would you want to change him? But the company that he works for, a new boss comes on who thinks only in terms of money and doesn't want to provide the accommodations that autistic employees like Lou and other people on his, on his team have become used to because it costs money. About the same time, some medical researchers come up with a quote, cure for the condition. The cure involves going through brain surgery, which essentially de-develops your brain. So it's at the developmental level of a newborn and then redevelop in an autistic direction. But the pace is 12 times faster. So one month post-surgery or at the developmental level of a one-year-old, one year post-surgery or at the developmental level of a 12-year-old, and a year and a half post-surgery, you're at the developmental level of an 18 year old and can be released from the hospital. So it raises a lot of questions. If we could do such a thing in real life, would that be desirable? Would we want people to go through that? Would it be worth the cost? Because of course everything has a cost, just us lose new boss, who thinks only in terms of cost. Yeah, Lou's new boss is, he has the characteristics of a psychopath, no emotions, no empathy, thinks only in terms of dollars and cents. So shouldn't he be the one forced to change his ways rather than the autistic people? Yeah, and it raises all kinds of other questions too, which I won't go into in the interest of time. Thank you, Jennifer. We'll now hear from Stacy Kennedy, our cultural correspondent. Hello. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, due to COVID, um, there certainly have been virtual events here and there, like online. And um, one of them I'd like to mention is uh, I've mentioned them before, but they are the Dream Achievers Band on Facebook. Um, they are musicians with autism and um, they are a bi-weekly, you know, performance group and, um, you just check their information on Facebook and just see what, um, you, you'll read a lot about the, like each musicians, especially a really good pianist. And there's lots of other, um, great musicians on there. So, um, and, uh, I guess this, the lat or second thing, you know, this is pretty short, but, um, there's this thing called guide, guidestar.org where, you know, a lot of people on the spectrum can um, take hikes and there's lots of events and festivals that um, you can read up about and cultural events that um, high quality and other like experiences. I am um, not sure how physical that is right now, but, um, but they, um, but it's something to definitely lo look into and, um, that yeah, there's certainly even during COVID times, you know, you could still be outdoors just safely. So thank you. 
Thank you, Stacy. Well, folks, uh, that's our program for this week. Until next time, I'm Keith Halperin. I'm Will Burnick. I'm Jennifer Brooks. I'm Stacy Kennedy. I'm Eric Usher. Mm -hmm. And we are Ascend TV, live on the autism spectrum. Until next time, stay well, stay safe, and take care. Thank you.